Hello and welcome to another edition of the Property Voice podcast. My name is Richard Brown and as always it's a pleasure to have you join me again on the show today. Okay, so we went myth busting last week when we discussed the ability to recycle cash through property investing. And last time we discussed buying a property and then seeking to refinance it later to extract all or or if not most of our initial cash investment. And our conclusion was that for standard properties, the best way of doing this quickly was to add genuine value to the property and not simply to cash in on an apparently stellar discount from other similar properties uh, nearby. But that is not the only way to do this, which is the subject of today's discussion, as we tr- as we're trying to release our cash by changing the basis under which a property is valued. So on with the show then. <coughs> Insert the property chatter bumper here. Now, if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, I I came across a number of people that were asking about recycling their cash investment in property deals. And last week, we answered the question of whether an investor could reasonably expect to recycle their cash investment quickly when buying at a discount known as BMV or below market value. Whilst I don't want to repeat and regurgitate that uh, episode here fully now, the conclusion was this. No, not really. (laughs) It'd be better to add some genuine value and then try to refinance instead. Otherwise, we may as well just sit it out and wait. But uh, check out that particular episode for the longer version uh, response to that than I've just given you. Probably just blown it there. Spoiler alert. (laughs) Well, the the second question around the recycling of cash uh, investment uh, topic that I I, I came across was this one. And again, I quote, Commercial uh, valuations on HMO, what's the real info on valuations and financing without the selling? I'm just going to do this this paragraph again, sorry about that. The second question around recycling our cash investment that I also came across was this, and I quote, Commercial valuations on HMO. What is the real info on valuations and financing without the core selling hype? End of quote. Or I guess if you wanted to reframe the question in the context of our discussion today, it might be, can I expect to pull out all of my cash investment in an HMO conversion project by refinancing at a commercial valuation within a short time of doing the conversion? Phew, that's quite a long question, wasn't it? (laughs) All right. But before going too far into this topic, I thought I would address the point about course selling hype that the uh, the questioner raised uh, earlier. And uh, I could easily have left it out. However, I think it's very important to bring it out into the open, in, in fact. And I, I often hear a lot of people with a very clear vested interest claim that HMOs are a great way to extract all of their cash investment funds. And these people may be sellers of courses or deal packages which are relevant to the topic. So they have a very clear benefit in making pe- people believe that claim. And I often hear the statement that you can get a house revalued at 10 times the gross rental income in such situations. So it's, a, it's obviously a house here that's being converted into an HMO and getting it you know, valued up at 10 times the, uh, the rent income. I'm tempted to say this is utter crap, <laughs> but here's my more considered response instead. First, how is it even possible? Well, the general principle, in all honesty, is indeed a valid one. Property can, in fact, be valued in several different ways. And if you want to know what these are, then take a look at uh, a guest blog post from Damien Fogg over at the Property Voice blog, which I'll reference in the show notes for you. However, uh, to to pick up a couple of key points, the the two main valuation methods to uh, concern ourselves with today specifically are the comparable value method, which is sometimes known as the bricks and mortar value, and the investment method, which is often referred to as a commercial valuation. Now, the comparable value method is is one we are are likely to be most familiar with, as it's the one that uh, most often applies to residential property, be it it somewhere we live ourselves or indeed as a buy-to-let. And essentially here, the valuer will assess the property's value by comparing it with a number of the most recent sales of similar properties in the immediate local area. Now, good comparisons will be similar properties sold in the similar sort of condition 
within the last six months and within a, within a quarter of a mile radius of the property being valued. And it goes without saying really that the larger the number of suitable comparables, the better the chance the valuer has of valuing it accurately and crucially the more confident they can be in that valuation. Of course, if there are not many suitable comparable properties available to benchmark against, then the valuer is likely to be cautious in their assessment. And this partly explains why high density urban property valuations are often more reliable and consistent than those in less well populated and dense areas such as small towns and villages. The investment method relies on a property being valued at a, as an investment property rather, and, uh, rather than as a, as a residential property. And it's very common with commercial property like shops, offices and properties like that. The value here is derived by the terms of the lease and especially the lease rentals, the lease rental income that is. But there's a few other important factors as well and um, in fact as we get into this discussion we'll see how the other important factors can play a part really. And this is where a lot of things can fall down because think people get hung up on it being a, uh, just simply a, a conversion of the, uh, a, basically a metric based on the gross uh, income when it's not quite as simple as that even for other uh, commercial property like shops and offices. Now HMOs are a hybrid type of property if you like on, on the one hand they're clearly residential as people will typically live there as their main or permanent home. However they can also be like uh, a small commercial premises insofar as that they're let out by the room and rather than a single property unit uh, they also have other services potentially attached to them such as providing furnishings, furnishings rather, utilities and broadband supply, cleaning, gardening and other things like that. And this opens up an opportunity to get it valued on a multiple of its rental income in a similar way to shops and offices might be. However, there's no clear definition of an HMO by the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, or RICS if you like, in what is known as their Red Book, which is their guide to valuing property. And as a result of this, each valuer will often make their own assessment of how they will value and categorise any given property. And that obviously leads to a lot of inconsistency. Add to this the fact that different lenders also have a different view of whether an HMO is commercial or residential on the one hand. And, e and even then those who do view it as a kind of a commercial or investment property on the other hand they, they still have an inconsistency in terms of how they interpret things and we'll come back to that a little bit later on. So basically it gets a little bit uncertain in, uh, in how we can achieve uh, an investment value on an HMO conversion as I'm, I'm sure you're probably realising. However, if an investment value is used, it's often based on what is known as the local yield in that area, in that local area. And uh, there are usually different yields across different parts of the country. And these are based on the actual rents being achieved for that type of property when compared to the local property prices there. And valuers tend to work out both the gross yield and the net yield valuation figures. And then more often than not, they'll plumb for, plumb for the lower of the two. The gross yield is used to calculate the value before any deductions are taken out. So it's literally the total uh, rental income uh, multiplied up to give you a valuation. We'll, we'll give you a couple of examples in a second really. Whereas the net yield will often deduct utility bills primarily from the rental income before it's used to again multiply up to get an end valuation. And in many cases a value will also stipulate the bricks and mortar value or if you like the comparable value method in their report as well. So we could end up with three different valuation figures in the same valuation uh, report which I've seen a couple of times myself I have to say. And to illustrate this I have an HMO uh, you know, where the local yields are stated as 13.5% gross and 10.5% net. And these figures are fairly commonly held views uh, of the local yields in that particular area. And most of the local valuers know this as well. And um, it's supposed to provide some level of consistency. And just for information, the, the gross rent on this HMO, it's a six bed HMO, uh, is £34,000 a year or thereabouts. Now to translate this into valuation numbers, this would value this particular HMO at £254,000 using the gross yield investment method or £267,000 using the net yield investment method instead. 
Now I actually paid 175,000 for the property and spent around 50,000 converting it into quite a high-end finish with en-suites and kitchenettes. So you could say that the bricks and mortar or comparable method valuation would be 225,000 so that's adding my 175 to my 50. And that's uh, assuming the total cost of the upgrade is, is taken into account by the valuer. Or it could simply be a lower figure, say the, the purchase price 175,000, adding on a little bit extra as it's now in a lot, you know, more decent condition uh, than it was when I took it on. And if it were valued as a standard house, just like the next door neighbour, then it could be worth, say, 200,000 pounds. Actually, that's a fourth different valuation possibility now, isn't it? And therein lies some of the confusion with valuing this and indeed other HMO properties. I've just given you four different valuations that could be applied to this very same property. So which one is the right one and which one will be used? Would it be 267,000, 254,000, 225,000 or 200,000? The first two are variations of the investment method or a commercial valuation and the latter two are variations of a bricks and mortar or comparable method of valuation. And if you'll notice, there's a 33% difference between the highest and the lowest valuation here, which will be very significant in our quest to recycle our cash. Actually, it can get even more complex than that, but it's probably best to leave it as just pretty complex rather than getting utterly mind-blowingly complex for now at least. But the answer then of which is the right valuation is this. It depends. <laughs> Yes, it's that phrase again, it depends. Sorry to bring it in, but it kind of does. It depends on the lender, the valuer, the area, the extent of works involved, how much like a standard residential property it still appears to be and the cost of reconverting it back, Article 4 restrictions, licensing, planning regulations, and so on and so on. And in an attempt to add some clarity to the differences between one HMO type and another, the lender, Shawbrook Bank, did actually release some information on the subject a while ago, and it's been quite, quite helpful. And they categorise HMOs into four distinct groupings. And, uh, and, and following these four groupings, it would lead to a different type of valuation outcome. And, uh, and it would follow some of the principles that I've outlined above. But what I'll do is I'll add, add a link to the show notes uh, so you can go and do a little bit of digging and look into that yourself a bit later. However, if you've ever tried to get an HMO valuation, you'll notice that not all lenders will define an HMO in the same ways that Shawbrook has here. And even if they did, the visiting valuer may apply their own take on the subject altogether. And given that there's, there's not even an equivalent of, uh, of what, uh, what Shawbrook have come up with in the Red Book, as I mentioned earlier, it's just going to get very confusing. There's going to be differences of opinion. It's going to be inconsistent. And I have literally seen this quite a few times. So it becomes a little bit of a hit and miss exercise. And even if you do something like, um, you know, what would be good practice would be to commission your own valuation report, survey report before you do the works. Um, get a get a panel, what a lenders panel um, surveyor in to do that do the valuation. Th those would be good, you know, practices to try and ensure you get the best outcome subsequently when you go back to refinancing. But unless you get the very same valuer from the very same firm using using a lender who's supportive, it may not be the case, unfortunately. So anyway, that was my little word of warning and a uh, little bit off script as well, I have to say. <laughs> but anyway, back to my uh, back to my example. You, you will possibly have noticed that none of the valuations in, in this example equated to 10 times the gross rental income figure, which would have come out, well, the gross rent was 34000 a year, and so that would have provided a valuation on this 10 times multiple that sometimes you might have heard floating around the industry of £340,000. Now, I'm not saying that's impossible. It is indeed possible. We'll come back to that. But um, if you would have clocked it, 75% of £340,000 would indeed uh, fully recycle all of my cash input pretty much. But I'm not here trying to sell you a course on 100% uh, cash recycling through HMO conversions either. <laughs> now the gross income method is, uh, that's, so that's the, you know, we're talking about the two investment methods that we could be used here. In this particular example, the gross income method is equivalent to around about seven and a half times the rental income, the gross rental income. And I've seen investment multiples at around this sort of level a few times now. 
but also some around the six times annual rent and some very rarely up to the ten times uh, at gross rent level that I've mentioned there. Now the, the, the net rental income multiple is a respectable 9.6 times the, the net rental figure but that's after deducting an allowance for bills to be paid don't forget so notional figure would be £20 per room per week to, uh, to deduct from the gross rental figure to arrive at a net rental figure there so uh, 9.6 times very close to 10 but it's on net rent it's not on gross rent so it's an important distinction to make and at this stage it's also worth highlighting that in some locations such as London say uh, a bricks and mortar value could in fact be higher than an investment valuation as well um, however it's, uh, it's perhaps overcomplicating things right now in what is uh, potentially a, a quite a complex subject already so I'm just going to leave that idea to soak for <laughs> perhaps for another time but the bottom line in this scenario is to try and get the investment valuation as high as possible such that when the property is refinanced, a 75% loan say, will be sufficient to release enough funds to cover all or a large part of our, our upfront investment. I know I have heard of uh, other other types of uh, loan to value ratio there but 75% is probably more common, more safe, more secure um, and that's why I've referred to it here. And you can see at a glance that uh, in my HMO example this was not actually possible based on that particular project uh, 75% of 254,000 pounds, or nine, uh, sorry, 190,000 pounds, would probably be the best expected expected outcome using uh, an investment uh, method of uh, valuation, and so that would imply leaving a, a, a bit of a, a chunk of cash in the deal, invested in the deal, and that's exactly what happened in this case. However, if I tell you that the original plan was to create a seventh bedroom, and had that actually been uh, approved from the planning department it would have left the, the highest valuation at £312,000 with a potential loan of £234,000 being, you know, being realistic and so more or less you know, covering my total cash investment there I have to say so the original plan would have done it pretty much uh, but unfortunately I got scuppered the uh, planning department turned down the application for bedroom 7 I won't go into the details but uh, suffice to say there's little chance for appeal in this particular case so what would have been a near, a near full, fully recycled cash investment deal proved not quite to be uh, as a result and, and sometimes we have to plan for that unfortunately as uh, professional property investors. C'est la vie as they say. In reality then it's, it's often the case that some money will, will need to be left into the deal or be provisioned for um, as a potential to, to leave into the deal. That would be a safe uh, recommendation as if you like. And you would have uh, observed by increasing the number of lettable rooms whilst containing the upfront cash investment a scenario could be created that gives rise to a fully cash re recycling opportunity with HMO conversions and this does depend as indeed with last week's discussion on any associated cost of financing that is picked up as well so the trick then to achieve the utopian position of a fully cash recycled HMO conversion is to find the so-called sweet spot uh, where the relationship between the gross rental income and the total acquisition costs is harmonized for the project. Now this will naturally lead us to looking at low-cost property areas on the one hand or alternatively at high revenue areas on the other. The reality though is that it will be those midpoint locations um, unless there are some other factors at play which are perhaps constraining uh, supply and demand factors that kind of thing but it'll be those mid-range um, areas will be most likely to generate the right balance between those two factors I mentioned earlier the, the maximizing the rental income and keeping uh, the uh, total acquisition, acquisition costs rather under control so hunting those sweet spot locations is, is really the the tricky part of this exercise I would say but as with our previous recycling discussion last time I tend to work on a general principle of leaving in at least some of my cash uh, in an HMO conversion project as well. Uh, I often find that looking at the project over a three year time frame horizon uh, we're more likely to arrive at a position where we can call it fully cash neutral and this would probably be the safest interpretation that I would give at this point. However to achieve the holy grail outcome of fully uh, recycling our cash from a, a, an HMO conversion we really would need that perfect mix of location, local yield factors, controlled acquisition costs, 
maximise revenues and both a supportive lender and valuer that recognises our business case. And uh, not to mention a slightly, you know, bit of luck along the way as well. It would also go, uh, go, go um, a long way to helping us get that right outcome. So in conclusion, I guess it's a maybe from me on this one, but it can definitely be achieved under the right conditions. And the real challenge with this method is that there is a, a lot more outside of our direct control of influence, unfortunately. We're still in a, uh, a very, we're still very much reliant, rather, on th a third party looking at us and indeed our project in the most favourable light for it to to succeed. Now, I've so far spoken about um, one specific method of changing the investment valuation method, uh, that from a residential valuation to a commercial one with an HMO conversion of a traditional house. But there are other ways, and I'll just touch on some of these briefly. Uh, that we can use this alternative valuation method um, to to um, to achieve a different type of outcome and hopefully uplift it above our um, our expectation. I'm not going to dwell on it right now, so these are just for reference, really. But they could include, uh, say, converting office, retail, or other commercial premises into residential accommodation. Sometimes a former corner shop or a disused office block is worth more as a house or flats than as the existing usage. And similarly, the idea of changing a residential property into a commercial one could be extended to include hotels and guest houses, for example. But obviously that would have to be in the right type of location for it to be successful in either scenario, really. The point being that if we're to have an open mind when looking at property, we can start to see different possibilities of how it could be used differently, just with a little bit of imagination. And uh, there's a value to having such an imagination for sure. So the next time you look at uh, an empty pub, an office block or a grubby garage block, just sit there for a minute and think, what if? <laughs> and as for HMOs, a word of caution on this one for you as well, just before I finish. Make sure that A, you target areas and indeed tenants that are best suited for your converted property. There's a number of different niche areas here in terms of uh, converted HMO and indeed obviously areas vary quite wildly as well so do your research on that and, and B consider what the barriers to entry are for somebody else or, or that may stop somebody else rather from doing exactly the same as you with the house next door or in other words what will the local market um, be like and are, you know will it will it get saturated quite easily if everybody starts doing the same thing that you're doing so just a word of caution there really but there you have it then uh, another recycling myth busted perhaps not quite as emphatically as last time but uh, i hope it uh, it comes over loud and clear that it is indeed um, possible but to be successful in property investment we need to not only be good with the numbers but we also need a, a fair degree of imagination, an eye for an opportunity, an appreciation of the art of the possible, and as I mentioned before, sometimes just a little bit of luck as well. <laughs> well, that's all I wanted to say on the topic of recycling at this point in time. Um, but there's so much I could, uh, which no doubt will return to the top of my mind, uh, thoughts and thinking again in the future. And I hope it was useful to you. The show notes can be over, found over the website, thepropertyvoice.net. And you know you can reach me anytime by email, most of the time at least, uh, podcast at thepropertyvoice.net. So just reach out any anytime, just have a chat. But right out though, and uh, what is now time-honoured fashion, I just wanted to say thank you very much for joining me on the show again today. Until next time on the Property Voice podcast, it's ciao, ciao.